Last week we talked about the beginning part of Exodus 19 where Moses came and called for all the elders of the people and laid before them these words which the Lord commanded him. This was Exodus 19 verse 7. And then in verse 8 it says, Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And so this week we pick up here where Moses went back to the Lord and told him that the people have said, yes, we want to be your people, your chosen nation, your uh, kingdom of priests. And now this week we pick up in verse nine where it says, and the Lord said to Moses, behold, I come to you in the thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So there's just some things here in the rest of chapter 19 that I want us to consider this morning. First of all, God comes down to us. He condescends. Um, we can't go to God on our own. Uh, we may try all sorts of ways and make all sorts of efforts to get there uh, to reach God to become reconciled with God to deal with our sin to find peace with God but in order for that to happen God must come down to us and he did that in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ when the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, we depend upon God to come to us because we otherwise would not go to him. We love him, the Bible says, because he first loved us. You see, God is a missionary God. He initiates and he comes to us when otherwise we would hide and substitute our ways and our thoughts for his. And what happens when we do that? That results in the creation of our own gods and in the creation of religions. This is exactly what Romans 1, 18 through 32 speaks about. I encourage you, go home, look at Romans 1, 18 through 32, and you will see what happens when man leaves the correct knowledge of God and substitute his own ideas about God. God ends up giving man up. And uh, just read the, the rest of Romans 1 and you'll see what I'm talking about. But God is a missionary God. He came to Adam and Eve in the garden after they had sinned and sought them out. Adam, where art thou? He used Noah as a preacher of righteousness as Noah built the ark every blow of the hammer and every every cutting of the wood was a sermon to the righteousness of God and the sinfulness of man. He called to Abraham and said, go to a place that I will show you and out of and from you I will build a great nation through whom I will bless the world. And then during the exodus from Egypt, any non-Hebrews who wanted to follow and serve the God of Israel were welcome to be adopted into God's people. You see, when, when they left Egypt, they had a, a mixed group of people, not just Hebrews. There were others from Egypt and other areas who decided they wanted to be a part of what God was doing. And then uh, here in chapter 19, as we just studied a couple of weeks ago, God calls Israel to be a kingdom of priests to the world. He wants them to be his representatives, his ambassadors, his missionary nation to the world. And he sends prophets to testify to God's will and God's ways as we go further into the Old Testament. And then as I've already alluded to, he sent Jesus into this world to seek and to save 
that which was lost. And now today he sends his people, the church, as his kingdom of priests to proclaim his gospel to the world. So just as God comes to us, we must go to others with the gospel. And so verse 9 here of uh, Exodus 19, the Lord uh, said to Moses, and then we see that Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. And I want you to consider something else, that God uses leaders. God uses leaders to take people from where they are to where God wants them to be. And this is how God orders and organizes his people to be on mission for him. God uses servant leaders. Now look with me in Exodus 19, beginning in verse 10, where it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down. Already talked about God's coming down to us, God's condescending to us. On the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So they were supposed to prepare themselves, consecrate themselves, make themselves ready. And listen, um, we should prepare ourselves to meet with God. You know, there are certain times when we should not be casual about meeting with God. Uh, and let me kind of explain what I mean by that. Generally, when we think about our personal relationship with God, you and God, me and God, that kind of thing, we might think or say things like, I learn from God, or I hear from God through his word. Um, I pray to God, or I do things for God. And as we speak about our personal relationship with God, we speak more in terms of friend to friend. It's more casual and it's more relaxed. And in that sense, you know, it's understandable and, and I feel like that's okay. But there seem to be unique, special times, special occasions that require more prayerful an intentional preparation and worshipful activity that call for the avoidance of the usual non sinful personal indulgences and that demand special focused self-denying attention upon God and in thinking about this it seems that corporate worship should be more expected and more formal with more planning and preparation because we're meeting with God. He's coming to us. He's with us. I mean, that's the name of our church, Emmanuel Baptist Church, Emmanuel, God with us. And that doesn't just mean that because he's omnipresent all the time, all places everywhere that, that God is with us, but it means, I believe, especially as we gather as his people together on the Lord's day. So, again, just suggesting that corporate worship should be more expectant, more formal, more have more planning and more preparation and I'm not just referring to those who are out up front, who are praying or leading music or playing an instrument or preaching the sermon. All of us here who are born again, we are the people of God. And we should not approach our corporate worship lightly. This is God Almighty. And I'm suggesting to you that we start preparing ourselves for worship before Sunday arrives. Get in the word. If you know what the scripture's gonna be in Sunday school or in the sermon, um, 
Read it ahead of time. Think on it. Meditate. Uh, pray for the service. Pray, pray for God's blessing, God's presence, God, God's special uh, anointing on it. Um, pray for the sermon. Pray for those who might attend. Pray for people to be saved. Pray for people to return to the Lord and repent. Pray for yourself that you would hear from God and perhaps be used by him to bless others. Pray for revival, for renewal, for encouragement, correction, courage, boldness, and for the presence of God to be evident in the corporate time of worship. You see, our approach to worship reveals what we believe about God. So is he worth our best? Is he worth our time? Is he worth our attention? And just consider, ha have you made yourself ready for this day? I mean, when you show up on Sunday, what do you expect? Have you done anything to prepare? What, what does God want from you? What does he want from us, all of us? And how desperate are we for God? Is he just a hobby that we tack on to our lives or is he indeed our life? Not just part of it or an aspect of it. Is he truly our life? Are we showing up at church for us or for him? And I understand, you know, it's not one or the other. We are here for us because why? We need him. But we want him to be glorified through what he does in us. Well, let's let's continue in Exodus 19, where the word says, you shall set bounds. This is verse 12. You shall set bounds for the people all around saying, take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. So let me just again suggest another thought that I see here in chapter 19, and that is that not only that God condescends or God comes down to us, not only that God uses leaders, uh, not only that, um, that we should prepare ourselves to meet with God, <laughs> but that God establishes the way in which he will be approached. In other words, God doesn't leave it up to us to figure out how he wants us to come to him. He explains it in the scripture. And in this case for Israel, we see God establishing the way in which he will be approached. And he makes the rules and he sets the limits. Why? Because he is the ruler yet. After all, he is God. He's our king, our sovereign, our ruler, and our creator. And he is holy, holy, holy. He is not like the gods of the nations who can be handled and touched and kissed and manipulated physically or approached casually. So God establishes the way in which he will be approached. Now, as we continue in verse 14, the Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people. And they washed their clothes. So they're preparing, they're consecrating themselves, getting sanctified, if you will, as the, as the, the scripture says. Verse 15, he said to the people, be ready, ready for the third day. Do not 
come near your wives. So this was such an occasion to where they were not even to have sexual relations during this period of preparation uh, due to the possibility of defilement. And uh, so Moses led the people to prepare themselves for their encounter with God. Each of them was responsible to make him or herself ready. Moses couldn't make them all do it. That was all up to each one of them to prepare themselves so that when they came together as a group, God would show up and do things in a mighty way. So it says here in verse 16, then it came to pass on the third day in the morning. Interesting, just, just saying it was the third day. Christ arose on the third day. I'm not saying there's a connection here. I'm just saying it's worth thinking about. So it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. So, all right, here it is. It's the third day, just like they were preparing for and God's presence is now descending upon the mountain. And the trumpet blows, summoning the people to the mountain. Now, some scholars say up the mountain. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But they hear this trumpet and see these mighty, uh, mighty, amazing, displays of grandeur and power and majesty and just God. And how do the people react? Probably like we would. They all trembled. They all trembled. Uh, and then in verse 17, it says that Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now again, we're back to that question. When the trumpet blew, were they supposed to go up the mountain? I think they were. Uh, Deuteronomy 5.5 5 seems to imply that they were supposed to have gone up the mountain. Let me just read that verse to you. Deuteronomy 5.5. 5. Moses says, I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire and you did not go up the mountain. And then in Deuteronomy 5, after that comes the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy means second law. And we'll, and we'll talk more about that as we get into our study of the Ten Commandments. But, but it seems to imply there in that verse that they were supposed to go up. They were to go up at the sound of the trumpet and meet with God. And at that time is when he would separate them from the nations and sanctify them as his kingdom of priests and his holy nation. But they did not go up. They were scared and... Uh, <laughs> Legitimately so, when you saw the display of what was going on on the mountain as the Lord descended in the description of that, as we're going to see here in just a moment, uh, they were scared and they didn't go up, but I think they were supposed to. And since they did not, Moses became a mediator who would intercede and mediate between God and Israel. And what ended up happening as things play out is the priesthood becomes limited to a certain group of people. In other words, one of the tribes becomes the tribes from which the priest comes, the tribe of Levi. And uh, so the priesthood is now limited to certain people and not to every Hebrew, to every Israelite. Israel reneged on their pledge to do everything that God said to do. 
because they stood and they stayed at the foot of the mountain. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you, folks. I always try to be honest and accurate and handle the word with integrity. Um, the, the chronology of some of the things in this chapter can be difficult to understand and interpret. It's not easy for me. Scholars don't even agree. And I know some of what is in the Bible can be confusing, but that doesn't make it untrue. Nor does it mean we can dismiss it simply because we don't fully understand it. And when it comes to difficult passages, with study, meditation, and prayer, any Christian can study the Bible and arrive at the truth. And as your pastor, I'm just trying to tell you that I will do my best to handle the scripture honestly, accurately, and with integrity. But I am just admitting to you the problem with some chronology here in this passage. So let's move on down into verse 18 where it says, Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And then you wonder why the Israelites were like, Oof. Uh, don't know if I want to get that close. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. So I'll just throw this out there. You know, when the Lord draws near, the, the presence of the Lord changes everything. And when the blast of the trumpet, verse 19, sounded long, notice it's just not a toot on the horn, it's a long blast of the trumpet. It sounded long and became louder and louder, verse 19 says. Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. So the trumpet sounds longer and longer. Why? I think... And this is just me um, supposing that God was being patient with Israel. He was urging them to come on up the mountain. And finally, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. And it seems like Moses did this after a period of time of waiting to see, are they really going to come up or not? but God answered him by voice. And this, this harkens back to verse nine where it's sort of a immediate fulfillment of what was said back in verse nine. Well, now let's look in verse 20 because it says, then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. So God comes down and Moses goes up. Just Moses to start with. And the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people lest they break through to gaze at the Lord and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves lest the Lord break out against them. So you can't just approach God any time in any way that you want to. At least that's, that's the rule. That's the concept he was laying out here to Israel, but, but there's still some truth to that today. We can't just approach God on our own terms. We cannot invent worship that God does not approve of. So we need to be careful that we're worshiping according to the word of God. Verse 23 and verse 24 says, but Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai for you warned us saying, set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. So Moses is saying, I don't think they're coming up. I don't think you need to worry about that, Lord. You know, again, I'm just thinking what maybe Moses was thinking. Set, uh, you warned us saying, set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. It's like, well, they haven't come up yet. I don't know that they're coming up. And then verse 24, the Lord said to him, away, get down and then come up you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. In other words, there was a time when they could have come up. But since they refused, they're not going to be allowed to come up now. Only you, Moses, and then the 
uh, priest, um, they're going to be able to come. And then verse 25 says, Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. So again, this is one of those places where it's difficult to understand some of the chronology. But as best I can tell, Israel did not go up when they should have. So God used Moses as his mediator. And now only Moses and the priest would ascend the mountain to meet with God. So next, we get into chapter 20. And this is where the Ten Commandments come into play. God gives us the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. And we see it a second time in Deuteronomy 5. That's one reason it's called the second law, second giving of it. And Lord willing, uh, on Sunday, February 19th, we will begin studying the Ten Commandments one at a time. And it's probably not going to be one per week because there's a whole lot in each one that it's going to take more time to discuss and develop. So um, we'll take a deep dive into them uh, next Sunday, February the 12th. Uh, Stanley McClellan will be preaching and he's told me he's preaching uh, from Colossians chapter 1 so I hope you'll read that ahead of time and prepare your heart for worship for Sunday morning but as we close out this morning let's read Exodus 20 verses 1 through 17 which is where we find the Ten Commandments and just kind of get ourselves acquainted with them once again so it says in Exodus 20, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Verse seven, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Verse 12, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbors. Those are the Ten Commandments. And we will pick up there on Sunday, February 19th. Be praying, be studying, be thinking about those things uh, as we look forward to taking a deep dive there. If you will, Please stand as we close the service in prayer and then have our final song. 